Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. On this particular passage, there has been a lot of debate. In fact, I think you could make the argument that this is one of the most debated passages in all of Christendom. But it's, I think that when you have something debated that often, that also means it's one of the more misunderstood passages. And one thing that I've noticed just sort of culturally about the Church of Christ is we tend to spend a lot of time focusing on worship and a lot of time on focusing on the scripture itself. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, I would say that that's even a compliment to us in a lot of ways. But I've noticed that we tend to focus less on anything that has to do with eschatology or that might even seem like it might be eschatology. And I think that uh, what, regardless of what side of the argument you fall on on this passage, it certainly seems like eschatology, even if it really isn't. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, and I am not saying, before we get into the lesson, that any of the events recorded here and any of the symbolism that's going to be talked about by Jesus is not something that could also be prophetic in the future. But I think it's also important that when we're talking about this kind of subject matter that we make sure that we don't say more than what the Bible says. So perhaps there is something here that is pointing towards the end of time but I'm not going to say that it does definitely unless I can find something in Scripture to back that up. And so I've always believed that the Bible is its own best commentary and that when we're looking through the Scripture on any topic, but especially one that has to do with prophecy, that the best way to understand that is the way that the Scripture tries to present it and to understand it the way that the people reading it at the time would have understood it as well. Uh, because we, of course, cannot definitively say more than the Scripture says. And, and one thing that I wanted to bring up, too, before we kind of get underway, is if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to ask them. I make go, no guarantees about being able to answer them, but the point is you're free to ask, and I certainly welcome those. If you've ever been in one of my classes, you know I like a lot of audience interaction. This one probably won't have as much just because of the nature of the passage, but I do welcome it whenever uh, it is presented. So... I would ask if somebody would, uh, we'll go ahead and read all three passages because they are very, very similar, but there are a few little nuances, so we're going to read all three. So if somebody would go ahead and start us out and read Matthew 24, 29 through 31. But immediately after the tribulation, the days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not be its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angel with a great trumpet blast, and they will call together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Okay. And if somebody would read Mark thirteen twenty four through 27. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not be its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power, and the Lord with you will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. All right, thank you. And if somebody would also read Luke 21, 25 through 28. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars on the earth dismay among nations and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift your heads because redemption is drawing. Right, so... You may have noticed that they almost sound identical, and in fact, if you were to hear uh, some, if you were to hear these three passages read back to back like we just did, and somebody didn't have the passage itself to look at, it'd be very difficult to even pick up the differences because of how similarly they're worded. Which to me means 
if it's something that is recorded in all three synoptic gospels and recorded so similarly to one another, must be something that they considered pretty important. And so because of that, I think it only emphasizes the importance of these passages. So we're going to go ahead and, and dig into these in a little more depth, but I think that it's always important to set the historical context for this first. First of all, the second temple had been rebuilt about 550 years prior to this passage. So you may remember that the original temple that was built by Solomon had been destroyed. It was rebuilt uh, after Babylonian captivity, and that's roughly 500 to 550 years, depending on how you date it, before this passage actually takes place. And so the second temple's been around for a little while now, and of course we're going to see how that plays a very important role in this verse because of the context in the scripture in which this conversation takes place. Herod the Great also started renovating this temple around 20 BC, and this lasted for 46 years. So that means that about the time of this conversation, those renovations have been completed for, you know, about a decade or so, roughly. Uh, but the renovations would have been finished roughly AD 26. So Herod the Great had, had recently refurbished the temple. So that's something important to, to make note of. And also, this is apocalyptic literature. And that also becomes important because apocalyptic literature became very popular around this era in history. We see it's starting to come into popularity right around the time that the 400 years of silence between the Testaments start. And that's why when you look at some of the later books of the Old Testament, you'll see a lot of apocalyptic literature. You'll see uh, in the Major and Minor Prophets, there are several prophets that use it. Uh, Daniel is one of the later books in the Old Testament, and it uses it quite a bit. In fact, we're going to be going to David, or David, we're going to be going to Daniel a few times in this lesson. And so because of that, it's important to understand that apocalyptic literature, literature that uses this very strong symbolism, uh, is going to be something that is, it, it sort of borrows from. Jesus is borrowing from that particular literary genre when he speaks this way, and he actually borrows several passages in this dialogue directly from apocalyptic literature like the book of Daniel. And then finally, it remained... Uh, it remained very popular well into the time of the early church, and this is part of the reason that we have the book of Revelation. It is written in the form of apocalyptic literature. And so this is something that the early Christians and the early Jews would have been familiar with. They understood it. They would have known that it was apocalyptic literature, and this is something that we see a lot in the intertestamental period. So a lot of the books written there, like Enoch, borrow heavily from apocalyptic literature, and this is a genre that may seem a little bit foreign to us, but it would have been something very familiar to them. And so uh, if somebody would go ahead and read uh, Matthew 24, 1 through 3, because I think that this is important in establishing the context of this particular passage. So this is where the conversation we're reading right now starts. Jesus left the temple area and was going on his way when his disciples came up to the point out of the temple building, uh, building to him. But he responded and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So, a couple of things that we need to note here. In this particular passage, the reason that this conversation comes up in the first place is because Jesus' disciples ask him a question, and it's a very specific question. When they are looking around the temple, they see all these wonderful buildings and how it's been recently renovated, so I'm sure it was a sight to behold in ancient Jerusalem for sure. And they're commenting on how beautiful it is and you know, probably the intricacy of the stonework and everything else, and then Jesus says, well, I'm telling you right now, a time is coming that there's not going to be one brick sitting upon another. And they become very interested in this, which of course I'm sure we would be too, if, if we were walking along with someone and past the Empire State Building and he says, time's coming and it's not too far from now that you won't even be able to tell that it was here at one point. I mean, that would be something that would be very stunning to us and we would be wondering what that's going to look like and why that would happen. And so you can understand why his disciples are very interested in Jesus saying this. And this particular version 
in Matthew has led to what's known as the three questions uh, theory, I guess would be a good way to say it. So essentially, the way that that goes is you'll see there that there are several questions asked in verse 3, where his disciples say, tell us when these things will happen, what will be the sign of your coming, and the end of the age. And so this has become sort of a competing theory for the idea that this is a single question. Because Jesus doesn't really give any clear breaks, we could kind of look at it as him answering three questions, or we could look at it as him answering one. And to be fair to those that I think kind of look at this passage and even look at the context of this passage, even when they read the entire chapter, I think that a lot of the reasons people automatically assume that this is discussing the end of the world is because of translations like the King James. And y'all know, I'm a fan of the King James, the big brown Bible that looks like it's falling apart that you may see me walking around with at church sometimes. That's a King James version. And so I'm not against the King James, but I do think that when we look at this same passage, verse 3, there is a translation that leads us to a conclusion that is incorrect. So if you look at the end there, the question that they're asking is, and of the end of the world. If you look back, end of the age is how more modern translations read that. But end of the world, well, that, of course, would denote something completely different. And so I don't think that the people that assume that this passage is talking about the end of the world and the judgment are necessarily way off base or acting in bad faith. But if you look at this translation, especially the way that we understand the world world the word world today, you can understand why they would think that this is specifically talking about Judgment Day. And so we'll talk about that here in just a second. The Greek word that is used here, uh, I, uh, I have no idea how to pronounce it, but that's the one that it is, is used there in the Greek manuscripts. And so uh, Ionos, I believe, is the way to pronounce it, but if I'm butchering that, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't speak Greek yet. Uh, but anyway... If you look in a few other passages where this is used, if somebody would read Luke 1, 69 through 70 for us, please. And has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of the servant David, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. And if somebody would read Luke 16, 8 for me, please. And his master complimented the unrighteous manager because he had acted crudely. Well, the signs of this age are more true in relation to their own kind than the sons of life. And if somebody would also read Hebrews 6, 4 through 5. For it is impossible to take the those who are all right, so I've highlighted in red up here all of the occasions where this Greek word aeonos is translated into something other than world. And we can see here it's clearly denoting in these passages, and there are, I think, about 30 occurrences of this word in the Greek New Testament. But we can see in these three passages it is very clearly denoting not a world, but a period of time. And by the way, I'm not saying that world is an inappropriate translation in every instance in which it occurs, because that is something that this particular Greek word could be understood to mean. However, we're seeing in this first passage it can denote the ancient past, it can denote the present, and it can denote the future. And so what it's being used here for is simply talking about a a large era in time, not necessarily the entirety of history or the world. And so because of that, we can understand that even though the the New King translation isn't necessarily terrible, it also gives off a connotation that is frankly incorrect according to the context of the passage. And so it's not that the translation is horrible, but it certainly doesn't give off the, it doesn't give the intention that it appears as though Jesus was trying to give to his disciples in that moment. 
So now that we've looked at some of the historical context, let's look at the scriptural context here. First of all, Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples. We already discussed that and saw that from the the first three verses in Matthew 24. Since Jesus is having a conversation directly to them and he's also answering a question directly from them. So we understand that as well that they were asking specifically about the destruction of the temple and when that will no longer be there. In Mark and Luke, they only ask him about the signs of the temple's destruction. That's important too, because even though we have this complete volume with all of the books of the Bible in it, Mark and Luke do not include the the other two questions. And so what I was talking to you about earlier, the three questions theory, I think the reason that that is errant is because it seems like Jesus got these three questions, but he kind of considered them all one. And the reason that we can say that is because the Gospels of Mark and Luke seem to also consider them just one. They don't include the other parts. All they do is direct the disciples towards his question about what's going to happen when the temple is destroyed. And so since these were written independently and weren't included in a single volume at the time of their writing, especially since we believe that Mark was actually the first gospel, it is not at all unreasonable to believe that the gospel writers of Mark and Luke saw just including that one question as sufficient, and Jesus gives the same answer. We saw it's almost verbatim the same in the three synoptic gospels. And so I'm not saying that the three questions theory has no merit, but it seems to me far more reasonable to say that this is all kind of considered one question. So they may be asking three questions, but it seems like the answer is pretty much the same for all three of them. And that seems to be how Mark and Luke felt as well. And then Jesus also says that this will happen, quote, immediately after the tribulation. And this occurs in Mark 24, 29 and uh, in Matthew 24, 29 and Mark 13, 24. So then the question becomes, what is the tribulation? Which is one of the more debated parts of this particular passage. So if somebody would please read Matthew 24, 15 through 16, which seems to be the, the tribulation that Jesus is pointing to. Uh, we, we see that this verse is just directly before the verses that we're studying this morning. So when you, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in a holy place, uh, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. So what he's talking about here, because he says after that tribulation, so we can see if he's talking about this directly before it, that's the tribulation that he must be discussing. So the tribulation seems to be synonymous with, or just another word for, the abomination of desolation. That is the tribulation Jesus is talking about. And if that is the case, what is the abomination of desolation? I'm opening the floor, by the way. Right? Any other thoughts on this? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if it's a 100% definitive answer, but I think it's pretty good. Um, I think that the best way to answer that question is to look at another occurrence of this exact phrase, abomination of desolation, because... This is one of those passages that preachers and Bible class teachers love because Jesus actually includes exactly what he's talking about. He references it directly. And so he says it was spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So let's go to Daniel. This is one of the occurrences of it. So if someone will read Daniel 11.31 for me, please. Forces from him shall appear and if somebody else will read the other occurrence of it, Daniel 12, 11. From the time of that, and from the time that the radio sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,200 
So we're looking at Jesus saying, this is the abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke of. And then we go to Daniel, and he says the abomination of desolation is some kind of invasion that will profane the fortress and profane the temple. And in both occurrences of this, he says it is the end of regular sacrifice. And by the way, this coincides with exactly what Jeremy was saying, is that Jesus says it's going to be armies. Okay, well, that seems to be what Daniel is saying too that there's going to be some kind of invading force that profanes the temple and the holy city. So then the question becomes, when will sacrifices end? When will the regular sacrifice end? Destruction of the temple. Right, destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So it's not something that is going to happen. We actually already know that it did happen. Right now, and, and I've had conversations with Orthodox Jews about this, they don't do sacrifices anymore. Not even the Jewish people that still believe that they are under the law of Moses continue to do sacrifices. That ended, at least the regular sacrifice in the temple, in 70 AD. And so this is a historic event that we can actually look back into history and see it occurring. And it continues to not go on until this day. And how long did Jesus say that it would be between this event, the abomination of desolation, and the coming of the Son of Man that we're talking about? Well, that's the period of time that Daniel's talking about, but you remember Jesus said it'd be immediately. He said immediately after the tribulation, this will occur. Um, By the way, just a cool point of of information here, the 1290 days is about three and a half years, and that's something that's used a lot in Revelation, but we won't get off into that today. We've got enough to talk about. All right, so then the question becomes, when is this going to happen? And... uh, Matthew 24, 34, Truly I say unto you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. Mark 13, 30, Truly I say unto you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And Luke 21, 32, Truly I say unto you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. So in all three of the synoptic gospels, they all agree whatever Jesus is talking about is not going to happen until the people that he is speaking to there will still be people that he is talking to right then that will see this happen. Which leads us to one of two conclusions. Either this is something that is a historic event, or there are some very old people walking around somewhere. Um, I mean, we're talking like Joe Biden levels of old. But (laughs) anyway, no, I'm sorry. I'm a political commentator. I have to work in at least one joke per class. Um, Anyway. But no, th- seriously, that means that I think that this is, would lead somebody to conclude that whatever Jesus is talking about has already happened because there's nobody that old walking around still today. And especially considering the group of people that he was speaking to specifically, it seems to be maybe a few extra people other than the apostles, but mostly just the apostles. And so this is going to be a very small group that has already perished. And so let's actually dig into, because we've, we've said a lot about what the passage is not saying. Let's actually look at what the passage is saying. Uh, and I think that that is a little frustrating because there is so much misinformation about this particular passage of Scripture that you have to do an awful lot to undo what people have, have said about it and sort of uproot some of that misinformation. But I do want to actually look at what the passage itself is saying and the importance of that messaging. So... One thing that we see there is that the stars are going to fall from heaven, the sun is going to be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and heaven will be shaken. So these are all very scary sounding events that do sound like the end of the world, do they not? I mean, if the sun's not around, we ain't going to last that long. And so it would make sense that this sounds like something that is talking about Judgment Day and the end of time. And you might say to me, because we've already talked about how these events have already happened, it would have happened around 70 AD, Caleb, how is that possible? I mean, look outside the window, the sun is still there. That's a fair question. I mean, I think uh, it's, it's not quite as definitive as people would say it, but uh, if they would say it that way, however, I think that that is a perfectly legitimate concern for anybody that asks us a question about this passage. And so the answer is, remember, This is apocalyptic literature, which the people that were reading it at the time would have understood is meant to be symbolic. It is not meant to be literal. 
And so because of that, we need to actually dig into what that symbolism means if we're supposed to derive the same meaning from it today as the people Jesus was talking to on the Mount of Olives 2,000 years ago would have understood it to mean. And we kind of look at that a little bit confusing, but the thing is we're very familiar with symbolic language. Whether you're a Bible scholar or not, symbolic language is not something that is foreign to us. We probably use it on a daily basis. We just don't always think about it. For example, I'm going to drop a ton of bricks on you. Does that mean the person is going to literally measure out one ton of bricks and drop it on top of you? No, it means that he's you know, angry at you and he's going to beat you up. That's what he's trying to convey there. Uh, I've got my nose to the grindstone all week. Well, that doesn't mean you've been literally working with a grindstone held up to your nose. It means that you've had a rough week. Uh, he's my rock. I've heard that one before. Well, that just means somebody that's strong and, and comforts you and that kind of thing. Or, uh, whoa, she's a fox. Well, we don't mean she's literally a fox. We mean that she's attractive. And so there are a number of different ways that we could look at this and, and see this as being symbolic language. And I don't think that Jesus is using it here nearly as flippantly. And I don't think that these symbols that Jesus is talking about are nearly as shallow as the ones that we're using here as just sort of common idioms in English. I do think that they're significant. I do think that these symbols were chosen specifically and carefully by Jesus, but that does not mean they were meant to be taken literally. So a good example of this is found in Isaiah 13, 9 through 11. And like I told you, apocalyptic literature became popular around the era that Isaiah would have been writing in. And so if somebody would volunteer to read Isaiah 13, 9 through 11 for me, please. Oh, the day of the Lord is coming, full with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation. And you will exterminate its sinners from it, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud, and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold, and mankind the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning end. So we're seeing similar language here. Uh, we're seeing that heaven is not going to give its light, and their constellations will not flash. The, the sun will be dark, and the moon will not give its light. This is talking about the same event, right? No. Not even close. And the reason we know that is because Isaiah tells us. If you look in Isaiah 13.1, the pronouncement of concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. So this isn't talking about Jerusalem at all. It's talking about Babylon. And where is Babylon when Jesus is talking about this? Babylon's in the past. Babylon has already been destroyed. In fact, Babylon was conquered by Persia, uh, conquered by Cyrus of Persia in 593, or 39. I'm a little dyslexic this morning. Uh, so this is something that occurred about 550 years before Jesus ever spoke this. But it's using the same language. And so obviously by the time Jesus had come around, the stars had not fallen out of the sky, the sun had not been darkened, the, the moon had not literally stopped to give its light. What he is discussing here is an event that ended Babylon. Alexander the Great conquered Persia in 334 BC. And so if you wanted to say, well, yeah, I mean, technically the Persians took over, but the, all they did was sort of co-opt the Babylonian Empire. Yeah, but even by 334 BC, still several centuries before Jesus says this, Alexander the Great had pretty much destroyed whatever was left over from the Babylonian Empire. And so it is not possible for these two verses to be about the same event. They happen about half a millennium apart from one another. And yet, we still have stars, we still have sun, and if we were looking at it from the same perspective that we are looking at this passage today from, we would say, well, how can that be? We still have stars, we still have the moon, we still have the sun. Well, you could have made exactly the same argument about Isaiah in the time of Jesus. And so it's very clear, and they would have understood and recognized this language, that this is not talking literally about the destruction of the planet. This is talking about something that is symbolic. It is going to be the destruction of your world. 
not the destruction of the entire planet, not the judgment of every human being on the face of the earth. It is talking about the destruction of this empire, the destruction of the world as they know it, that something new is going to be coming up. And so this is very powerful and symbolic language, but it is meant to be exactly that. It is not something that necessarily is talking about the end of time. And because of that, we understand that it's not possible that these verses are meant to be taken literally because, as we've already pointed out, we still have our celestial bodies intact. So Jesus and his disciples would have known that he was not speaking literally either. The prophetic books are filled with language just like this. We can see the same thing where it's talking about the destruction of Edom. We can see prophets making similar uh, appeals with language when it talks about other nations surrounding them. We see uh, when it's talking about the prophets of the northern kingdoms, similar things talking about Assyria and when its end is going to come. And so this is something that would have not at all been foreign to the disciples when Jesus is talking here. And so if that is the case, and this is symbolic language, what does that mean? It means that God is describing the end of your world, not necessarily the world that exist overall. And it's important to note, this is the language of uncreation. So when we look at the creation narrative, what do we see happening even before mankind starts walking upon the earth? God creates the sun, the moon, the stars. What happens when Adam and Eve sin against him? He uses the language of uncreation. From dust you came to dust you shall return. And that is the consequence of sin. So in a similar way, what Jesus is talking about here when he talks about worldly judgment happening, he's using the language of uncreation. And that's the same thing that the prophets were using. They were saying, you have sinned, rebelled against God, and defiled his precepts. Therefore, the blessings that he bestowed upon you, creation, prosperity, is going to be undone just like the because of, as a consequence of sin, the creation was undone in the sense that Adam was once dust and now because he sinned is going to become dust again. We're seeing kind of symbolism happening here. Now, of course, it's a lot more literal in Adam's case, but the point is it is the uh, language of uncreation. It is God undoing the blessings that he gave to us, and the same thing is going to happen with Jerusalem. God established them as the covenant with Abraham that was ultimately to, uh, seen to through the law of Moses, now he's going to uncreate them because the time of the old covenant has gone away. They have rejected his son and crucified him. So I'm going to uncreate the nation. I'm going to end the sacrifices. I'm going to end the law of Moses. And this will be my new kingdom, the kingdom that was set up by Jesus. And this is a definitive end to the Jewish age because, of course, the sacrifice, temple worship to this day, does not go on. Even though we have an actual nation state of Israel, they still don't do sacrifices and the temple has still never been rebuilt. All right, so the Son of Man in the clouds. This is another important symbol that we're going to talk about here. Um, it's really interesting that this language of him showing up in the clouds, we're only going to read one of these passages, but it is present in all three of the transfiguration account. So if somebody would read the transfiguration account from Luke 9 verse 34. While he was saying this, a cloud formed the event of shattering them. And they were afraid as they went through the cloud. Okay. And if someone would also read Jesus' dialogue with the high priest when he's about to be crucified in Mark fourteen, sixty one through sixty two. So with the passage that we're reading today, the coming of the Son of Man on power in the clouds, the passage that we just read where Jesus is talking to Caiaphas, and in all three of the transfiguration accounts in the Gospels, where it talks about Jesus coming in the cloud, what do you notice similar about all three of those verses? God 
God speaks. What else? What does he say? Exactly. These are revelation passages. These are passages where Jesus is asserting who he is and who he's from. And so in all three of these symbolic uh, passages of speech, and in the transfiguration it was actually literal, but in all three of these passages, the thing that we find similar about all of them is that this is a revelation to whomever is being spoken to that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. And so I find that that is really interesting that when he's talking about coming in the clouds and power and being seated at the right hand of God, it's all talking about who Jesus is. It is a revelation of his identity. Also, John uses very similar language to this in his introduction to the book of Revelation. So if somebody would read Revelation 1.7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Clouds, and every eye will see him, he will go to pierce them. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. All right, so it seems to be that what John is talking about here is a similar event. That Jesus and the sign of the Son of Man is going to be coming in the clouds. But an interesting thing that he notes in this verse, all will see him, even those who pierced him. Again, it seems that we're dealing with an event that would have happened a really long time ago because the people that were there and present at Jesus' crucifixion and pierced him with a spear and pierced him with nails and pierced him with thorns and so on and so forth, they're not around anymore. And so it seems that both the Apostle John and all of the Synoptic Gospels are using the same symbolism, talking about the same event, but they all agree that it's something that would have happened before that generation would have died out. All right, so the trumpet and the gathering. What is the trumpet? Again, I think the Bible is its own best commentary, so if somebody would read Daniel 11, 33 through 35 for me. But not all at once. Then they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help, and many will join with them in democracy. And some of those who have insight will fall, to refine, purge, and cleanse them until the next time, because it is still the dawn at the end of the time. So, I don't want to go too far and overstep my bounds here. But remember that this is the passage that we looked at earlier where it's talking about the abomination of desolation, where Daniel clearly says what that is going to be is the end of the regular sacrifice. And we see here at the beginning at verse 33, those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many, yet many will fall by the sword. Is it possible that the trumpet that is going to be sound, in other words, the warning that this event is taking place, Is the scripture of God himself? Is it possible that this warning that Jesus gives his disciples, where he says, guys, when this happens, you've got to flee to the mountains. You've got to get out of here. You don't need to stick around anymore. And Daniel is describing a group of people that have insight that will give understanding. So is it possible this warning trumpet is actually this passage that we're studying right now? that that's going to be able to give those who are followers of Christ a warning with enough time to be able to flee Jerusalem. I don't think that we can say that definitively because the Bible isn't 100% clear, but it does fit pretty well. And I think that that is at least a, a viable theory for all of this. And so that warning trumpet, I think, could very well be the passages that we're studying right now about Jesus. So let's go ahead and look at really what does all of this mean for us? Because I think ultimately, if we're going to study the scripture, if we still have it, it means God wanted us to have it. The passages that might be difficult for us to understand or take a lot of time to unravel, well, they're there for a reason. They have a purpose. And so we need to look at what this does mean for us. First of all, I do think understanding any scripture requires proper context. I think that we've made that pretty clear. 
that with just a little bit of understanding and a little bit of research, looking through the Old Testament and understanding the passages that they themselves would have been more familiar with in the style of writing that they themselves would have understood, it really doesn't take that much time to be able to start to unravel it and understand it ourselves. Another point I would bring up is to take the Bible literally when it's meant to be literal and figurative when it's meant to be figurative. I think that a lot of Christians, well-intended, make the mistake of not necessarily taking it literal when it's supposed to be or not taking it, taking it figuratively when they meant it to be or picking and choosing. And I think that, that one's far more dangerous is because then you can just decide which ones we're supposed to take literally and which ones we're supposed to take figuratively, which means you can basically interpret the Bible to say more or less whatever you want it to say. And so the reason that it's important for us to understand when the Bible is trying to be literal and, and when it's trying to be figurative is to look at the scripture itself because it offers its own best commentary. Uh, also, this event may not apply to us directly, but its message does. It may be true that we're not looking forward to this passage about the Son of Man coming forward. We may not be seeing that happen to us in the future because, as we've already established, it seems as though this is talking about something that happened in 70 AD. However, the messages contained within it are still relevant, just like the messages contained within the Old Testament. And they do speak to us about God and His nature. Um, I think that the message from this is to live in a state of readiness. And we didn't touch on this quite as much as the rest of this passage does, but I think that that is one of the primary messages here, is that we're supposed to live in a state where we are looking forward to the coming of, of Christ, the second coming, and whether it comes in the form of actually living until Judgment Day or our own death, we should live in a state of readiness to be judged by the Son of Man. God also did away with the old law at the cross, and then He did it again in 70 A.D., he judged Jerusalem, and just like he did in the Old Testament, gave them some time, gave them an opportunity to repent. He gave them the warning, but didn't destroy them right away. This is something that we see over and over and over again in the prophets. And so he sent his son. His son dies about 30 AD. He gives them about 40 years to repent, but after that, it's done. Temple worship is gone. The genealogy is gone. The Jews today can't even trace back their lineage to Abraham, which was the most sacred thing. All of the records that were kept in the temple, those were destroyed. And so this is a definitive end to the Jewish age. God is saying, that is old and done away with. My son is how you have a relationship with me now. And finally, God's hand of protection left Jerusalem, but not his elect. And I think that that says a lot about how God cares for his people. Because we see when this abomination of desolation happened, the Christians had insight because Jesus had warned them. And so we don't have a lot of history to back this up, but it seems to be implying, based on the book of Daniel, that even though God's hand did leave protection from Jerusalem and allowed it to be destroyed, the people that followed Christ, they had some measure of protection. And I think that that's something that we also see throughout the Old Testament narrative that when we look at God punishing nations for various things that they had done, one thing that he continued to do is protect the people that were faithful to him. And that says something about God's nature, and it says something to us today, that if we continue to follow him and, and try to do his will, then even if we have horrible circumstances, even if it feels like the moon and sun and stars are falling down around us, that God's protection is still going to be there for us. So, uh, any questions or comments before we end up today? I think when you talked about the beginning questions, I know you, you kind of dismissed with three questions. I, I, I really see two different questions there, not really three. Mm -hmm. Of kind of what, when is this going to happen with regard to the temple? You know, when is the temple going to be, when is the temple going to go away? When is it going to be torn down? And then when are you coming back? And you kind of see those two questions, I think, given and answered. And I'm not sure that they're the same question. And, and I'll leave it to Chris. I know next week we're dealing with the second maybe part of this. And we're not going to build all the parables that follow after with regard to it. But you see that, that word but there in verse 20, 36. 
that almost seemed the transition there of kind of contrasting what he said before, which I agree wholeheartedly with you, dealing with a historical context of when is Jerusalem going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So when he is coming back again. Uh, and you almost see a transition there of, of the, using that word but, I believe, of going into that transitional, of maybe trying to answer that second question of when are you coming back? Because, you know, he not only talks about it there, but he talks about being ready, and then he talks about the parables, uh, like the, the virgins being ready and that kind of stuff. So you kind of see a transition there, but there's no doubt, I think, when you look at the historical context of Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah, that there's no doubt that this is a historical context that was going to happen before those people died and i think you, you pointed that out all know. right so since the already wrong i do this really quickly but i do think that there's some merit here because that only occurs like i said the only time we see more than one question is in the gospel of matthew what does the gospel of matthew have that mark and luke don't matthew 25 which would mean that it's a passage of Scripture that was dealing with it, and that would better explain why we get two questions in Matthew instead of just one. So, and that's, that's the reason that I said I don't want to completely discount the theory, but I think that people are looking at that and trying to lump all of this into one thing at the end of time, and it's simply not the case. So, great point, and I appreciate you bringing it up. I didn't want to delve too deep into it, but that's, that's the quick answer. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it. To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call the TV Guide and tell them. You know, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe! 